there, but uh, we're going to do it anyway. Because <laughs> yeah. uh, it's a little bit different uh, than talks I usually give. Sometimes I'll talk about birds, I'll talk about uh, habitat, things like this. Um, this time I'm, I'm talking about art and uh, what goes into the art. I don't remember if it was Kathy or Jane who asked me to do it. But said, hey, why don't you talk some about what it's like photographing wildlife around here? And I said, and I thought about it, and I didn't really want to talk about how all I do every day is live mug for hours and hours <laughs> later. Uh, so instead, I wanted to talk a little bit about the thought process behind it, really why I'm creating what I create. Um, so that's what I'm going to do today. And it will relate to wildlife, nature, and all different sorts of things. Um, so feel free to interrupt me if anybody has any questions about anything. Um, it's a crazy topic anyway, so the one-off topic is not a um, So if you had to describe the low country in 15 seconds to somebody, how would you do it? Salt marshal, what do you think? <laughs> the most marvelous ecosystem in the world. Well, this, this question is kind of what I feel like my job is. Um, whether it's to somebody who, who lives here and I'm trying to remind them of what the, what the area conjures up to them, or if it's somebody who's, who's visiting or who even hasn't visited um, that's just interested. Um, that's what I'm trying to do. I don't have much time with a photograph, with a, with a piece of art. People nowadays with cell phones and TVs, people look at things so quickly and move on to the next thing. I mean, Used to be the in the old days, people would go to a museum like the Louvre and they would sit and they would yeah. stare at a piece for hours. Some people would bring out a sketchbook and my sketch or jot down notes. You don't see anybody do that now. No, let's take the selfie and then move on. So anyway, so I'm trying to get uh, impressions across, and hopefully this looks okay. I don't know. From my angle looks kind of weird. The colors look really strange, but. Uh, a little better back there? Yeah, looks good. Maybe it made me feel like it looks better at least even the dark. Um, so, so one of the big things, so obviously we have this big wide open landscape that's around us and it's pretty unique. Um, the, the stuff that we have here looks a lot different than the coast, um, certainly in Maine, certainly the coast down in, in South Florida. Um, even what we have in North Carolina doesn't quite look the same. Maybe the sand dunes are similar, um, but but certainly the, the salt marsh that we have here is pretty unique. Um, you, get, you get big extents of salt marshes in the Gulf as well, um, but those wind up being quite different ecologically than the salt marshes we have here. Um, and so while I'm going to talk about really what I like to have as a thought behind my art, um, unfortunately it's not 100% of the time that it's the reality um, that I'm creating images with the, with the sort of thoughts that I want. Um, I have to make money, I have to support my, my family. Um, so sometimes I'll take photos like this, which I don't really like so much because they're a bit derivative, first of all, and since it works, everybody know what this tree is? Los Angeles, really famous. Everybody loves it. A lot of people think South Carolina, they think fly bulbs like this. Um, so part of it's that it's derivative. The other part is that this really isn't to me, sum up the way live oaks are, um, because this is a very particular situation. Um, it's a fantastic tree, beautiful tree, um, 400 plus years old, but there's a little park around it. Everybody's cleaned up all the vegetation. They've opened it up. Um, live oaks are one of the, belong to our coastal scrub forests. Um, and they usually grow up in these really dense areas with lots of palmettos around. And surely for the first 350 year of this oak tree life, that's the way it, it was. It didn't have this nice neat lawn in front of it. So it's, to me, it's, it's not a very natural oak tree, um, although it's absolutely phenomenal and beautiful. And it sells well. And even if I have people who ask me to do a black and white version, I will do a black and white version. So. Sometimes I compromise my principles a little bit. <laughs> um, so how do I want to portray nature instead? Um, sometimes I'll do it uh, just, just very artistically and, and graphically, image like this. Um, these are white pelicans. We get these in the, it should be coming in, I don't know, late November, I think is when they start to show up. Um, until then, they're, they're further north and west. Um, 
And then uh, I'll do it with other animals too, not just the birds, but again, the same sort of idea, just really maybe about shape and, and contrast and tone. Um, but again, these, I like these images, but these are not really some of the central themes of, of my particular artwork. Um, and I'm, I'm telling you about why I create my artwork. Um, I don't know that any other artists out there think the same way about their work. So it's kind of a, a one-person scenario. Um, they have their own ideas and, and thoughts behind their work. Um, sometimes it's, it's kind of obvious. Uh, I was talking to someone recently about Picasso. And whenever I think of Picasso, there's always one piece that always jumps out to me, the Guernica. Because, and that's one where you can really tell a lot of his intentions, what his thoughts were behind. Did, is that a piece well known by people? It was an anti-war piece, essentially. Um, really violent looking scene. Um, a lot of almost grotesque shapes to this. But, uh, but uh, the theme of his work in that piece comes across very, very strongly. Um, a lot of his other work does too, but it's they can be more complex. Um, so what are some of the major themes? Um, first is the unique environments that we have here. Um, the environments we have, you can find them all geographically within a couple hundred miles of us, some of them a bit further away, um, but we have a unique mix. Um, and not too many places get that. Um, so we talked before, we have the salt marsh. We have these big, wide open salt marshes. Um, someone once told me that uh, uh, Beaufort County is twice as large, more than twice as large at low tide than it is at <laughs> That's just kind of how extensive it is. And I believe that is not just a old wives tale, that is actually fact. Um, uh, obviously we have the, the ocean and, and the coastal, some of the shore beach landscapes um, that people see so well. Um, we have cypress swamps, uh, little ones on the little bits on the island, and certainly as you get into the, the mainland around us, we have a lot more of these cypress swamps. Um, and you can start to see in some of these images here versus the earlier images where things were very graphic. Um, I'm trying to make that a little bit obvious. Um, this prothonotary warbler, it's sure it's a prothonotary warbler, but I deliberately made it so that you that the cypress knee is, is just as big of a part of the image as the as the warbler is. Um, and then I'll go even more <coughs> more into the, the environmental themes of it. So so here, this obviously it's a photo of a, of a great blue heron, but it's really about the, the fresh water wetlands um, that's surrounding this heron. Um, and this is really where we'll see um, a lot of my themes revolving: is the interaction of the wildlife with the, with the landscapes, the land itself. And I'll explain some of the reasons why I do that. Um, as we proceed. Uh, one of the first the, the sort of precepts that I try and keep with all my work is I want to show nature from its perspective, what it's like out there, not how we see it. Um, and that's, that's quite, a bit, uh, quite a bit different than what you normally do. Um, and I try very hard, this is my bi biological background, not to anthropomorphize. Because um, we get in trouble when we start thinking that it's that wildlife acts the same way or feels the same way as even has the same needs as people. Um, so I try not to do that. Actually, you know, uh, well, I'll save that for a little bit later. Um, so I try and bring you down. I try and make you feel things like, like you are almost in the, in the shoes of this, this tricolor heron here, ready down close to the water, waiting to, to pounce on that fish. So you get the feeling you feel the wind blowing from behind. Um, so it's different than the way you normally see it. You're just kind of out on the porch looking down and you see him walking around through the, through the water. Uh, same thing here with this, this gal a little. I mean, obviously, there's, we've got all these colors and shapes and things like that. Um, but still really gives you this, this feeling of pausing right when you pull the pulled this seed pod up out of the water. Um, but then even more so, as I mentioned before, I'm trying to pull back into these types of images um, where you, you get more of an emotional contact with the photo. 
Um, you start to feel the sense of place. You start to feel like, oh, I remember that fall day when I was out there in the salt marsh and the, the herons were doing this or doing that. It was, the wind was blowing through and I couldn't keep my hat on or whatever. I'm trying to get those, those emotional contacts, make it feel almost like you can smell that, that salt breeze when you're out there. So. <laughs> Um, and whether it's a, a landscape or, or wildlife, I'm doing the, the same sort of thing. Um, now you've noticed uh, what hasn't been in here in any of these photos? No people. Um, not only are there not people, but there aren't any signs of people either. Um, and that's generally the way I keep my photos. And that's, that's really important to me, not because I have something against people or things like that. Um, <laughs> But I want you to kind of see nature at its most pristine and feel like that's something that you treasure. Um, and so that you can you know, work with find a spot like that without any coffee cups. <laughs> <laughs> well, this, the biggest secret is when. Do it at a time when it's been really stormy and rainy and things like that. And they, or and then after the tide cycle is gone, this is actually up. Uh, behind where the tide would break. But anyway, in that type of weather, nobody comes out, um, except crazy people like me. <laughs> um, so, so one of the main reasons why I have this, this big connection with the environment in my pieces is, is that I'm trying to not necessarily preach about it, but uh, subconsciously trigger some sort of conservation response um, with people who see my artwork. Um, and that's why I've, I've done things like made sure I don't capture any elements of humans. So you can see what it's like at its best, and then hopefully uh, people will want to, uh, to keep that around. Um, and I've, I've changed my, my thoughts on, on nature has changed a lot as I as I sort of grew from a kid to where I am now. Nature was always my thing. Um, I mean, in the introduction, Alan was saying that I was down here as a child, and every day I was out in the salt marsh. Um, sometimes I was catching shrimp, but most of the time I was like seeing what lives there, um, seeing what birds were there, where the, where the frogs were, where everything else was. Um, and that's from this to now. That's that's been the one constant thing in my life. Um, so when I was a kid, I thought, wow, nature's amazing, you've got all these wonderful things out there, let's all be Charles Darwin or John, James Audubon, and let's study it. Then as I started to grow up, I started to realize, oh no, nature's in trouble. <laughs> and I started to see how it's in trouble, and I thought, okay, all we need to do is tell people about it, and as soon as people realize the problem, we'll be able to make some happen. <laughs> And now I'm getting old and cynical, and I'm realizing that nature is losing badly, really badly. Yeah. Um, and unfortunately, people just don't care enough. And that's the way it is with most things in life. People, unless you immediately put it in front of them that this is going to happen to you if you don't do it, then they don't realize the ramification, and they'll continue doing what they're doing. And the problem with nature is nature's slow. So when we hurt it, it takes a very, very long time for it to, to recover. Um, and it doesn't take too much to, to sort of damage it. Um, so obviously the things you hear a lot about are extinctions and extirpations. So something that's extirpated, is the species isn't gone, it's just gone from that area. Um, so we have, uh, we have a lot of those. Um, but uh, this is one that I remember from my, when I used to come down here as a kid. Um, there are a lot of these guys around. This is a brown duck, common brown duck. Um, I, I saw them in a lot of places in the world. I saw, saw them out in Savannah. Um, I haven't seen them. I've been down here eight, nine years. I haven't seen one here. Um, they're not going from the States. Um, I've certainly seen them up by, uh, by Botany Bay. Um, and there's tons of them down in Florida. But uh, I have my thoughts. Well, I shouldn't say thoughts. They all got older. These guys are interesting because they, they actually do really well around people, as long as people are in low densities. When people start to get in really high densities, they don't do as well. Why did they go to Florida? 
<laughs> well, the places they're going to Florida are some of the more open areas, some of the more agricultural areas. Um, and then it may spill over. Uh, so you may get ones that live inside the agricultural areas go for a day or two into your backyard and hang out in your feeder. So you think they live there. Um, these are ground kind of ground ups, and that's, that ground part's really important. And that's why they didn't do well in, in high densities of people. Uh, because high density of people bring a lot of pets, specifically cats. Uh, and the ground ups tend to not do very well uh, cats. Um, Bobwets, uh, I saw my huge Bobwet in uh, the low country. I can't remember exactly what it was. I'm not sure if it was Savannah or some other area. I remember it was uh, this, this big pine forest. And I was just walking through randomly. I'd just seen an armadillo. And then, poof, six or seven of these quail flew up right in front of me. It was a pretty, pretty neat thing. Um, and then they landed not too far away. And I got to watch them for a little bit. Um, but uh, they, uh, they're actually really complicated what's going on with them. Um, people aren't quite so sure why they're having kind of such a tough time. Um, so these are all historically. Historically, it's not that long ago. We're talking 150 years ago. That these are just some of the big animals that used to be around here. Um, and I say around here, I mean in this county. Yeah. So this is not far away. Um, so there were wolves, cougar, black bear. We saw the down brown bug, northern bobwhite, the whooping cranes, gopher tortoises. Um, some of these gopher tortoises are still in the state in a couple areas. Um, Common ground up is still in the state of the years. There are just some bob like black bear in the mountains and up there. Myrtle Beach, they're going all right. No. Um, but how about that? <laughs> well, that's when we get to real extinctions. These are just extirpations. These are species that still live in the world, just not, uh, not here anymore. So you can imagine with these guys on already, it's the whole, these are some of the big movers and shakers of an ecosystem. So already it's looking quite a bit different from the way it's doing. In terms of extinctions, and these are not all extinctions, these are just animals that used to live in Buford County that are now extinct. Um, we certainly had Carolina parakeets here. We had Iberville woodpeckers. Um, has anyone been to uh, Lake Marion? Has anyone been out in the water there? This one kind of hit close to home to me because um, I was taking a, a group out onto Lake Marion to photograph the cypresses. Um, Lake Marion was made uh, as man made. They dammed up uh, the river there in the uh, like 1940s. Um, and, and it used to be a river area with cypresses that lined it. Um, and then when it flooded, they thought the cypresses were going to die, but the cypresses hung on just fine. Anyway, when you go back up and in there, you know, there's some really, really old cypresses. Some, some are, are dead now, um, but some are not. Um, and in a lot of these cypresses, you'll see these, these really large nest cavities that aren't, and the pileatids aren't shaped the same way um, that the ivory builds are. Um, so you can see there's a good number of ivory build nest holes back up and in there. Um, but no woodpeckers. Uh, passenger pigeons, I'm not sure how many passenger pigeons actually would have been here. Um, I think they like the forest areas a bit more. Um, Bakke's warbler, anyone sees one of those? Certainly let Jack know. <laughs> make sure you take a picture. You yeah. heard it will not accept this one. Uh, <laughs> uh, but there they are, they were a South Carolina native bird. Um, Dusky Seaside Sparrow, um, their last uh, Last area that they were was uh, around the, same, uh, the John River area in Florida, um, but they're up close to the here too. So these guys are all gone. I mean, we don't have, we have, does anyone know how many species we have that come through here? Is it 300 ish? I would guess somewhere around 300, um, and those are five gone, so it's not that small. Um, worldwide, we are losing things super, super fast. Um, this is a low end estimate, but uh, roughly a thousand species. Not birds, this is everything. Um, but that's a thousand species a year. Um, historically, the estimation is that uh, the world used to lose about one or two species a year. So that's, that's a lot of work, than uh, what the background extinction rate is. And obviously, we don't just care about whether or not birds go extinct, um, we care about 
go, going out, looking out in the, the creek behind our yard, and if we see one parent in a day, and we used to see 20 um, an hour, that's a big change for us. Um, so what's, what's driving that here? Um, and the big thing is uh, low country land use, um, and what's going to happen with that. So old timers may know this better um, than me. I went, I, this next little bit I did off the top of my head, <coughs> what I remember. I double checked some developments just to make sure that it was true. Um, so this is our area, how you know this map. By the way, this is a lot of how I find where I'm gonna take a lot of my photos, especially the landscapes. Um, a lot of times I'll start with these uh, satellite aerial maps and zoom in and try and say, is, can I find a place where there's no human houses and, and stuff like that around uh, with the light going in the right direction? And I, I can believe this summer I really started to do it a lot, um, looking for some of these salt marsh landscapes. I couldn't believe how difficult it was. Um, anyway, uh, so historically, um, when I was a kid and came down here, these areas in brown, um, those were the areas that were built at that time um, that had development. So it wasn't, it wasn't much off the island. I mean, there was obviously a uh, bluff and, and there's Moss Creek. Um, I believe Fripp was, was going over there and a lot of the stuff in the, uh, the Buford area was, was developed. Um, so, and that was back in uh, the 1980s. So since the 1980s, um, this purple stuff is uh, what our new developments. Um, Obviously not all developments are the same. A development doesn't necessarily mean it's going to kill all the wildlife in the area. Um, some wildlife doesn't tolerate any human contact near it. Some wildlife does. Um, so it's going to depend. Um, that's a lot of new development. A lot. And you remember what I said about uh, Buford County with high tide and low tide? So most of this, a lot of this is not, uh, is not dry land. So what's, uh, how, much, how much do you think is left that actually is dry land? <laughs> well, that's the dry land that's left. Mm -hmm. And then we'll give it just to show you just a little bit to the left. Um, and the vast majority of this is uh, protected lands in some way or other. Um, hunting island over there, um, Pinkney, this is um, Victoria Bluff. Yeah. Um, there's, there's some on the Fusky that's, that's left uh, undeveloped. Um, back in the 1980s, there was, there was just a few small houses on the island. So I can see it not developed at all. Um, even most of these little islands in here, a lot of them have houses. And, um, a little bit in the back of Palmetto Bluff that's not developed. And then even some of this that I'm saying is not developed is certainly has some human use to it. So. So this is why some of those things are gone, and this is why a lot less of what we have is around than used to be. Um, and, so, and it is amazing that some of it's done great even with all of that. Um, but because of this, um, this is why I've made some of these things central issues in my, in my work, is because we have to kind of realize what's going on with this land. Because um, in another 20, 30 years, and you saw how much yellow was left. Fortunately, a lot of that's is set aside, so it hopefully won't be developed. Um, but I wouldn't be surprised if most of the rest is gone uh, much sooner. Um, so this is, it's kind of hard to see in the, with the, the lights around. But this was a photo I took in the summer on uh, Hunting Island. This photo was extremely difficult to take. And it should be much, much more impressive than that. Um, this is the Milky Way. Um, the reason, and this is the whole, the spot within a roughly 90 mile circuit, circle that has the least light pollution. So, uh, my exposure I think was something like eight times as long as what it would have been if 
if I had shot this um, in some of the places I shoot out west, where there isn't like a little bit. So obviously for us, that doesn't matter too much. Um, and this is also taken at night during the time everybody's supposed to have the lights out for the turtles, right? Yeah. But remember, there's a lot of animals that use these nighttime cues to, to navigate. The turtles, obviously, when they're, they're hatching or the shore. Uh, but a lot of the birds, most of the birds migrate at night as well. Um, and they use, they use a, a number of different cues, um, but some of it is the, are the stars. And I'm also being really tricky. I got lucky that there was a cloud covering up. Otherwise, you would have seen a, a bit of a yellowish glow over here. Um, what's in that direction? Yes, that's it. That's all good. Prepping on that. It's in that direction. Yeah, you can see it. Um, so one of the other big themes that I try and, and cover is I, tr I do try and focus a bit on the interdependence of, of the different life. Um, and I know people like to jump to the big charismatic animals. Um, so everybody likes to see the, the painted bunting, and that's always really popular. But I make sure I focus on, on some of the other animals as well. Are, are the painted bunnies still coming back? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I saw one. Yeah, they should be here. They, yeah, are, are, there, are there more or less? Um, I don't have. The, I certainly don't have the numbers on that. I don't know if anyone's watching them. Um, I would imagine that they count them in some of the areas where they like. Um, not hunting islands. Well, they might come there, but also Huntington Beach. Um, they have a large number of them there. Um, There's a lot of sea lions. Yeah, um, they're not. They're not doing great on the Atlantic coast. Um, they're doing fantastic in the, the Texas part of the range and the scrub there. They're not doing as high here, but I don't think they're really declining, at least rapidly. You know. Um, yeah, around here they. Uh, well, they do like a lot of the scrub stuff, so scrub stuff tends to be some of these dunes areas, the edges of the, where the forest meets the more open area, so we do have some of those, those spots that are touched. Um, but the birds tend to be kind of like the last indicator of what's going on, because um, they're not the ones driving the, the food webs in most of these ecosystems, and they're not the ones as quickly affected by it, because they they're more mobile, they can go somewhere else. Um, or they can come back or they can find another. So I, I do like to, uh, to use some of the little guys um, and, and draw some awareness, whether it's the, the butterflies. These guys are doing terrible. Um, I mean, I'll be surprised if we have a, a population of them in 100 years. Um, they're, just, they're plummeting their numbers. Um, you know. They, I, they, have, they, have, they have the worst case scenario of any animal because they have to, they use the whole range from north to south, from Mexico up through to Canada, northern Great Lakes sort of area. And they migrate, uh, they don't always, they don't migrate like birds, they don't do the whole trip in one generation. Um, they do it by, by breeding and then moving and breeding. Other animals do that too, dragonflies do that. Um, but the problem with that means that if any one of those things that you go through is not out for you, you're stuck. You can't get to the rest of the place. Um, and they're, they're hard to get in several of those areas. Um, not, I mean, certainly not all these small, smaller species are doing badly. I mean, ghost crabs aren't doing badly. Um, but certainly you can tell when the beach area is healthier, our numbers are higher. Um, amphibians are fantastic indicators. Certainly, their degrades barometers of, of water conditions, um, especially the ones that, that live most of the time in the water, um, not so much the tree frogs. But, uh, um, a lot of the loving vertebrates, uh, especially the ones that have aquatic life cycles, like the, um, the dragonflies, are great indicators of what's going on. Um, so I so I photograph these these animals as well to try and bring attention to them. I know people don't look at them and have the same feelings to the for the so we'll see a little bit of the evolution of how I, I treat these. Um, so earlier on I might have taken more photos like this of the boss race. It's just kind of a painter photo. Um, maybe a little bit more artistic, but again still still a bit behavioral. Um, 
But these are the kind of photos that people say, oh wow, these aren't necessarily the photos that really strike somebody to, to realize um, the importance of some of these conservation issues. <coughs> um, so I, I try and get more into images like this um, that will start to show some of the areas where they live, um, show some of the, the beautiful cypress trees, and then I don't know. Most, probably most people look at this and still say, "Oh, it's a nice, it's a nice shape, nicely shaped tree with an osprey on it." But only <laughs> subconsciously, somewhere in the back of their head, they realize, "Wow, cypresses are amazing. We need to, we need to preserve these. These trees take a very long time to reproduce." Uh, and then ones that will give a little bit of an emotional response, um, like this, this osprey coming back to the nest with fish sunrise. <laughs> Uh, not East Mason. Um, this is uh, this one actually is down in Florida, but you could do the same thing in you know, Lake Marion. Uh, we have the the cypress will go down in more open water. The last one they love cypresses. They also love areas that have lots of fish. You can always tell. Um, so it's been a little bit pessimistic uh, because a lot of nature is losing, um, but but certainly there's there's still hope. Um, so. And that's why I, I am shifting a little bit more to a bit more landscape work uh, with or without the wildlife. Um, it tends to attract a, a broader group of people who can start to appreciate the land. Um, some people, when they see an animal, they, they think, oh, it's another animal photo. I feel like I hope. Certainly, hopefully, most of the people get the ones. Um, but I do try to show these wide open areas as well so that they can appreciate this. And maybe they think, oh, when I look out in my yard, I don't see that. I see this pole, that pole, I see all these docks, I see all these, these tractors that have dug up those trees over there. Um, this one, by the way, is near the two um, I'm also coming from above a lot now these days, because uh, it really helps show some of the breadth of, of these landscapes. This is Lemon Island. Lemon Island has kind of become one of my favorites. Because when I looked on the map, it was one of the areas that both in morning and in sunset, there's a lot of areas that I can look and not see any people and only see uh, a pretty natural habitat. So it's very successful. Uh, this is Colleton River. Anyone know what that dock is? Yeah. That's what I'm This is the, uh, the, uh, the aquaculture facility that we do the, uh, did, was the last uh, picnic? No, it was here, it was right here. We had it here, but we traditionally we had it out there many years. So again, really going for this sort of emotional response, hoping to, to trigger that to if people are around, this was this was August. Um, yeah. yeah, this was this was at the end of the day. Um, big, huge. There was actually a, a big bubble ray. Oh, yeah. Yeah. yeah, I couldn't I couldn't get into position in time to have the the second one really strong. Um, that's over there, by the way, on the back right, and that's the this is. This is Bluffton, that's the bridge to Pinckney, and that's the bridge to Hilton. Mm -hmm. That's right here in our backyard. Wow. This is also right by here. Um, that's Pinckney behind, and then Hilton way behind. So we got beautiful stuff. Um, we don't have as many beautiful views of the beautiful stuff as we used to have. And the views themselves aren't essential. It's how it's impacted uh, the ecosystem around it. Salt marshes are great. They're one of the best ecosystems because you can't build on that puff mud. You can't do anything with that puff mud. So the puff mud is, I mean, water quality affects it a lot and, and some of those and dredging and things like that. Um, but in general, you saw that map that got swallowed up. It was the forested areas. It was some of the freshwater wetlands. It wasn't. It wasn't the salt marsh. Um, people will build right up to the edge of it, but uh, a little more than that. Yeah. Uh, bonus video can tell me this is.
So there were a lot of examples to this period. Yeah. 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 But uh, yeah, we I mean, here the eagles don't really care too much about people. They're too worried about the other eagles because they are big eagles and big scavengers. It's also a beautiful place. Um, there is certainly, you certainly can see the, the hand of man there, but it's, it's, it's light. Um, so it's possible to have situations. I mean, it helps that you have a low population density. Um, that makes it easier. Uh, that one's not, I mean, he may be a little bit dirty, but that's mostly just that he's not a fully mature bird. I mean, I probably should be saying a little bit more about it. Actually, it usually tends to be, the juvenile birds tend to be more dominant than the adults. It's kind of interesting to watch. But I almost always see a juvenile scare away an adult, and almost never an adult scare away. So this one's already fed, you know. Since the salmon are so big, they can't eat at all. Eventually, they get, the other one comes and scares them away, and they don't care anymore. Here's another young bird. It will scare away the other ones. Um, but now, I'll still take some pictures that, uh, that kind of describe the environment and then that feeling, that like emotional context, so that we can, we can realize that. Uh, Maybe the eagle doesn't need wilderness to survive, and they'll do all right around people. Um, it's not a bird that really needs pristine wilderness. Um, but even still, it's better in this pristine state. <coughs> and there's other things around it too. So, this is a more about about trying. It's not that cold. <laughs> Everybody thinks you go up to Alaska and so it's really, really freezing. In like November. Um, this time I'm going a little bit earlier, but uh, it barely snows. The town is usually around 40 degrees. I'm like the eagles usually low in the winters. Not warm, but, but not too warm. I personally hope had come last year and it was surprising. Even though I told But we have, we have some great gatherings like that too. Um, certainly, I think our best gatherings are, the, are when we get the good spring shorebirds. That's kind of the most unique gathering that we have around here. But we have other ways to other birds that come through, other migrations, other nesting birds that are amazing. We've got this, a fantastic bluebird population. One of the things all that clearing for housing does is it makes a lot of wide open spaces with little bugs that the bluebirds can pick off. The golf courses too. Uh, <coughs> Um, so, so I do though I do a lot of the images. Obviously, I'm, my main thing is that I'm I'm creating artwork for people to uh, to take home and, and sell. Um, but I'm also the best. So the best interactions that I get, I, I tell my wife that uh, if we have a kid who comes in, I don't advertise this, but uh, give a huge discount for a kid because I want to. More than anything else, if I can get a kid inspired by, by nature, by and they get, kids tend to go for the simpler, uh, less environmental shots. Um, the colorful um, flamingo, they always call this blue mill flamingo. Um, or the dolphins, like the kids really like uh, some of those images. So. If, the, if I can get a kid to take that, bring it home, look at it, and start to realize that there's this amazing world of nature, um, this is not showing the the terrible state of our oceans. You think land is bad, wait till you get underwater. 200 miles offshore, I went underwater and looked at the coral reef, thought it was going to be great. I mean, it was a great coral reef, but it was littered with, with garbage everywhere. Wow. On the remote coast of Alaska, I always garbage every six, eight feet. Um, yeah, it's, it's, and that's what washes up, you know, it's worse underwater. So that's, uh, those are the, some of the themes going behind. That, that's why I create the photographs that I do. Um, if you'd like to, to see some of my work, certainly come by the gallery in Bluffton. Uh, you get to talk to my wife, who's a lot more pleasant to talk to than me. <laughs> 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 
and if you do like things like photographing the eagles, um, I do 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 workshops with that. Uh, with eagles, it's a five-day workshop. In the, um, questions people have about anything. 